Along the first Belarusian front, in the deep darkness of the forests, there was complete silence. Beneath the pines and camouflage netting, the guns were lined up for mile after mile and stepped back caliber by caliber. The mortars were in front. Behind them were tanks, their long rifles elevated. Next came self-propelled guns, and following these, batteries of light and heavy artillery. Along the rear were 400 Katushkas, multi-barreled rocket launchers capable of firing 16 projectiles simultaneously. And massed in the Kustrin bridgehead on the Oda's western bank were the searchlights. Everywhere now, in these last few minutes before the attack, the men of Marshal Georgi Zhukov's armies waited for zero hour, 4 a.m., Captain Sergei Golbov's mouth was dry. With each passing moment, it seemed to him that the stillness was becoming more intense. He was with troops north of Kustrin, on the eastern bank of the Oda, at a point where the flooded river was almost 500 yards wide. Around him, he would later relate, were swarms of assault troops, lines of tanks, platoons of engineers with sections of pontoon bridges and rubber boats. Everywhere the bank of the river was jammed with men and equipment, and yet there was complete silence. Golbov could sense the soldiers almost trembling with excitement, like horses trembling before the hunt. He kept telling himself that, somehow I had to survive this day, for there was so much I had to write. Over and over he kept repeating, this is no time to die. In the centre, troops were jammed into the bridgehead on the river's western bank. This key lodgment, it was now 30 miles long and 10 miles deep, which the Russians had wrested from General Bus in late March, was to be the springboard for Zhukov's drive on Berlin. From here, the men of the crack 8th Guards Army would launch the assault. Once they seized the critical Silo Heights directly ahead and slightly to the west, the armour would follow. Guards Lieutenant Vladimir Rozanov, 21-year-old leader of an artillery reconnaissance section, stood on the west bank near the Bed Army girls who would operate the searchlights. Rozanov was sure that the lights would drive the Germans mad. He could hardly wait for the girls to switch them on. In one respect, however, Rozanov was unusually concerned about the forthcoming attack. His father was with Marshal Konyev's forces to the south. The young officer was angry with his father. The older man had not written the family in two years. Nevertheless, he had high hopes that they might meet in Berlin and perhaps go home together after the battle. Although he was fed up with the war, Rozanov was glad to be on hand for the last great assault. But the waiting was almost unbearable. Farther along the bridgehead, gun crew Chief Sergeant Nikolai Svishchov stood by his battery. A veteran of many artillery barrages, he knew what to expect. At the moment the firing began, he had warned his crew... Roar at the top of your voices to equalise the pressure, for the noise will be terrific. Now, gun lanyard in hand, Svishchov awaited the signal to open fire. South of Kustrin, in the bridgehead around Frankfurt, Sergeant Nikolai Novikov of a rifle regiment was reading the slogans scrawled on the sides of nearby tanks. Moscow to Berlin, read one. Another said, 50 kilometres to the lair of the fascist beast. Novikov was in a frenzy of excitement. His enthusiasm had been whetted by a morale-building speech given by one of the regiment's political officers. The impassioned and optimistic pep talk had so stirred Novikov that he had promptly signed an application to join the Communist Party. In a bunker built into a hill overlooking the Kustrin bridgehead, Marshal Zhukov stood gazing impassively into the darkness. With him was Colonel General Chuikov, the defender of Stalingrad and commander of the Spearhead 8th Guards Army. Ever since Stalingrad, Chuikov had suffered from eczema. The rash had particularly affected his hands. To protect them, he wore black gloves. Now, as he waited impatiently for the offensive to begin, he nervously rubbed one gloved hand against the other. Vasily Ivanovich, Zhukov suddenly asked, are all your battalions in position? Chuikov's answer was quick and assured. For the last 48 hours, Comrade Marshal, he said, everything you have ordered, I have done. Zhukov looked at his watch. Settling himself at the bunker's aperture, he tilted back his cap 
rested both elbows on the concrete ledge and carefully adjusted his field glasses. Chuikov turned up the collar of his greatcoat and pulling the flaps of his fur cap over his ears to muffle the sound of the bombardment, took up a position beside Zhukov and sighted his own binoculars. Staff officers clustered behind them or left the bunker to watch from the hill outside. Now everyone gazed silently into the darkness. Zhukov glanced once more at his watch and again looked through the glasses. The seconds ticked away. Then Zhukov said quietly, Now, comrades, now. It was 4 a.m. Three red flares soared up suddenly into the night sky. For one interminable moment the lights hung in mid-air, bathing the odour in a garish crimson. Then, in the Kustrin bridgehead, Zhukov's phalanx of searchlights flashed on. With blinding intensity, the 100 fought huge anti-aircraft lights, supplemented by the lights of tanks, trucks and other vehicles, focused directly ahead on the German positions. The dazzling glare reminded war correspondent Lieutenant Colonel Pavel Trojanowski of a thousand suns joined together. Colonel General Mikhail Katakov, commander of the 1st Guards Tank Army, was taken completely by surprise. Where the hell did we get all the searchlights? he asked Lieutenant General N. N. Popiel of Zhukov's staff. The devil only knows, Popiel replied, but I think they stripped the entire Moscow anti-aircraft defence zone. For just a moment there was silence as the searchlights illuminated the area ahead of Kustrin. Then three green flares soared into the heavens and Zhukov's guns spoke. With an ear-splitting, earth-shaking roar, the front erupted in flame. In a bombardment that had never been equaled on the Eastern Front, more than 20,000 guns of all calibers poured a storm of fire onto the German positions. Pinned in the merciless glare of the searchlights, the German countryside beyond the western Kustrin bridgehead seemed to disappear before a rolling wall of bursting shells. Whole villages disintegrated. Earth, concrete, steel, parts of trees spewed into the air and in the distance forests began to blaze. To the north and south of Kustrin, thousands of gun flashes stabbed the darkness. Pinpoints of light, like deadly firecrackers, winked in rapid succession as tons of shells slammed into targets. The hurricane of explosives was so intense that an atmospheric disturbance was created. Years later, German survivors would vividly recall the strange hot wind that suddenly sprang up and howled through the forests, bending saplings and whipping dust and debris into the air. And men on both sides of the line would never forget the violent thunder of the guns. They created a concussion so tremendous that troops and equipment alike shook uncontrollably from the shock. The storm of sound was stupefying. At Sergeant Svishchov's battery, the gunners yelled at the tops of their voices, but the concussion of their guns was so great that blood ran from their ears. The most fearsome sound of all came from the Katushkas, or Stalin organs, as the troops called them. The rocket projectiles whooshed off the launchers in fiery batches and screeched through the night, leaving long white trails behind them. The terrifying noise they made reminded Captain Golboff of huge blocks of steel grinding together. Despite the terrible racket, Golboff found the bombardment exhilarating. All around him he saw troops cheering as though they were fighting the Germans hand to hand, and everywhere men were firing whatever weapon they had even though they could see no target. As he watched the guns belching flames, he remembered some words his grandmother had once uttered about the end of the world. When the earth would burn and the bad ones would be devoured by fire. Amid the tumult of the bombardment, Zhukov's troops began to move out. Chuikov's well-disciplined Eighth Guards led the way from the Kustrin bridgehead on the Oder's western banks. As they surged forward, the artillery barrage remained always in front of them, carpeting the area ahead. North and south of Kustrin, where assault crossings had to be made across the flooded river, engineers were in the water laying pontoons and fitting together prefabricated sections of wooden bridges. All around them waves of shock troops were crossing the Oder without waiting for the bridges, tossing and bobbing in a variety of assault boats. In the ranks were troops who had stood at Leningrad, Smolensk, Stalingrad, and before Moscow, 
men who had fought their way across half a continent to reach the Oda. There were soldiers who had seen their villages and towns obliterated by German guns, their crops burned, their families slain by German soldiers. For all these the assault had special meaning. They had lived for this moment of revenge. The Germans had left them nothing at home to return to. They had nowhere to go but forward. Now they attacked savagely. Equally avid were the thousands of recently released prisoners of war. Reinforcements had been so urgently needed by the Red Army that the newly freed prisoners, tattered, emaciated, many still showing the effects of brutal treatment, had been given arms. Now they too rushed forward, seeking a terrible vengeance. Cheering and yelling like wild tribesmen, the Russian troops advanced on the Oda's eastern hanks. Caught up in a kind of frenzy, they found it impossible to wait for boats or bridges. Golbov watched in amazement as soldiers dived in, fully equipped, and began swimming the river. Others floated across clutching empty gasoline cans, planks, blocks of wood, tree trunks, anything that would float. It was a fantastic spectacle. It reminded Golbov of a huge army of ants floating across the water on leaves and twigs. The odour was swarming with boatloads of men, rafts full of supplies, log floats supporting guns. Everywhere were the bobbing heads of men as they floated or swam across. At one point, Golbov saw his friend, the regimental doctor, a huge man named Nikolaev, running down the riverbank, dragging behind him a ridiculously small boat. Golbov knew that Nikolaev was supposed to stay behind the lines at the field hospital, but there he was in this tiny boat, rowing like hell. It seemed to Golbov that no power on earth could stop this onslaught. Abruptly, the bombardment ended, leaving a stunning silence. The cannonade had lasted a full 35 minutes. In Zhukov's command bunker, staff officers suddenly became aware that the phones were ringing. How long the sound had been going on, no one could say. All were suffering from some degree of deafness. Officers began taking the calls. Chuikov's commanders were making their first reports. So far, everything is going as planned, Chuikov told Zhukov. A few moments later, he had even better news. The first objectives have been taken, he announced proudly. Zhukov, a tense figure since the opening of the attack, became suddenly expansive. As General Popiel recalled, Zhukov seized Chuikov by the hand and said, Excellent, excellent, very good indeed. But pleased as he was, Zhukov had too much experience to underestimate his enemy. The stocky marshal would feel better when the vital Silo Heights near Kustrin was seized. Then, he felt, success would be assured. Still, that should not take long. Apart from everything else, Russian bombers were now airborne and beginning to pound the areas ahead. More than 6,500 planes were scheduled to support his and Konyev's attacks. But Zhukov believed that the artillery bombardment alone must certainly have demoralized the enemy. In the operations room of his advance command post in the Schönewalde forest north of Berlin, Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichi paced the floor, hands behind his back. Around him, telephones shrilled and staff officers took reports, carefully transcribing the information onto the war map lying on a table in the centre of the room. Every now and then, Heinrichi paused in his pacing to glance at the map or to read a message handed him by Colonel Eisman. He was not surprised by the way the Russian offensive was being carried out, although most of his officers were awestruck by the massiveness of the bombardment. General Busser of the 9th Army described it as the worst ever, and Colonel Eisman, basing his opinion on early reports, believed the annihilating fire had practically destroyed our front-line fortifications. Under darkness on the night of the 15th, the majority of the Vistula troops had swung back to the second line of positions as Heinrichi had ordered, but there had been difficulties. Some officers had bitterly resented giving up their front-line positions. It looked to them as though they were retreating. Several commanders had complained to Heinrichi. Has it ever occurred to you, he inquired icily of one protesting general, that nothing will be left of your nice front-line fortifications or of your men after the Russians open fire? 
If you're in a steel mill, you don't put your head under a trip hammer, do you? You pull it back in time. That is precisely what we're doing. The difficult stratagem had taken most of the night. From all reports in the areas where troops had been withdrawn, the manoeuvre had proved successful. Now, in the second line, the men waited for the advancing Russians. On one part of the front, Heinrichi had the advantage. West of Kustrin was the sandy, horseshoe-shaped plateau of the Silo Heights. It ranged in height from 100 to 200 feet, and it overlooked a spongy valley known for the streams veining through it as the Oderbruch. The Russians would have to cross this valley in their advance from the Oder, and all along the crescent-shaped plateau, Heinrichi's guns were trained on the lines of approach. Here, on these critical heights, lay Heinrichi's only chance to blunt Zhukov's attack, and Heinrichi knew Zhukov would undoubtedly have given this fact great consideration in his planning. The Russian would need to seize the plateau quickly before Heinrichi's guns could shell the Red Army's Oder bridges and create havoc among the troops advancing across the low-lying marshy terrain. Obviously, Zhukov had hoped to knock out almost all resistance with his massive bombardment, making the capture of the heights that much easier. But because of the German withdrawal from the front lines, the majority of Heinrichi's army and artillery were intact and in position. The defensive plan had gone well. There was only one thing wrong. Heinrichi did not have enough of either men or guns. Without Luftwaffe help in the air and without reserves in men, guns, panzers, ammunition or fuel, Heinrichi could only delay Zhukov's offensive. Eventually, his enemy must break through. Along the entire front, Heinrichi's two armies had fewer than 700 operable tanks and self-propelled guns. These had been dispersed among the various units of the 9th and 3rd Armies. The heaviest division, the 25th Panzer, had 79 such vehicles. The smallest unit had two. In contrast to Zhukov's artillery strength, 20,000 guns of all calibres, Heinrichi had 744 guns, plus 600 anti-aircraft guns being used as artillery. Ammunition and fuel supplies were equally critical. Apart from shells stored at battery sites, the 9th Army had reserves sufficient for only two and a half days. Heinrichi could not hold the Russians for any appreciable length of time, nor could he counter-attack, because he had dispersed what little armour and artillery there was to give each unit a fighting chance. He could do only what he had known was possible all along. He could buy a little time. As Heinrichi looked at the map and the thick red arrows marking the Russian advances, he thought bitterly of the panzers that had been transferred to Field Marshal Schorner's Southern Army Group to stem the Russian attack which Hitler and Schorner had insisted was heading for Prague. Those armoured units would have given Heinrichi seven panzer divisions in all. If I had them, he told Eismann sourly, the Russians wouldn't be having much fun now. Bad as matters were, the crisis still lay ahead. Zhukov's attack was only the beginning. There were Rokossovsky's forces in the north to reckon with. How soon would they attack von Mantofel's third army? And when would Konyev launch his offensive in the south? Heinrichi did not have to wait long to learn of Konyev's intentions. The Russians' second blow came along the extreme southern edge of the line held by Bus's army and into Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner's sector. At exactly 6 a.m., the troops of Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front attacked across the river Nysa. In tight V formations, the red fighter planes banked and headed for the river through bursts of bright pink flak and streams of red, yellow and white tracer bullets. Then, with dense clouds of white smoke pouring out behind them, they screamed up the valley, less than 50 feet above the metallic grey river Nysa. Again and again the fighters bored through the anti-aircraft barrage, laying a thick, fluffy blanket of smoke that obscured not only the river, but the eastern and western banks as well. Marshal Ivan Konyev, watching from an observation post on a high point directly above the river, was well pleased. Turning to General N. P. Pukov, whose 13th Army would soon join in the assault, Konyev said, Our neighbours use searchlights, for they want more zero light. I tell you, Nikolai Pavlovich, we need more darkness. Although Konyev was attacking on a front of about 50 miles, 
He had ordered the smoke screen laid over a distance almost four times as long to confuse the Germans. Now, watching through artillery glasses mounted on a tripod, Koniev noted that the smoke was holding. The wind velocity had been figured at only half a metre a second, no more than a mile an hour. With satisfaction, he announced that the screen was the right thickness and density, and exactly the correct height. Then, as the planes continued to lay smoke, Koniev's massed artillery opened up with a tremendous roar. His bombardment was as merciless as Zhukov's had been, but Koniev was using his artillery strength more selectively. Prior to the attack, Koniev's artillery commanders, knowing their observers would be blinded by the smoke screen, had pinpointed every known defence line and enemy strongpoint on topographical maps and had then zeroed in their guns. Besides hitting these pre-selected targets, the first Ukrainian guns were deliberately blasting out avenues running west from the Nysei for the assault troops and tanks that would follow. Rolling barrages, like fiery scythes, methodically chopped paths several hundred yards wide through the German positions. As they did, forests began blazing as they had in Zhukov's area, and seas of flame stretched away from the river for miles ahead. Koniev was leaving nothing to chance. He was driven not only by his ambition to reach Berlin before Zhukov, but by another even more important reason – the unexpected speed of the Western Allies, who were now only 40 miles from the city. Koniev thought one or both of two things might happen. Eisenhower's forces might try to reach the capital before the Red Army, and the Germans probably would attempt to make a separate peace with the Western Allies. As Koniev was later to put it, we did not want to believe that our Allies would enter into any sort of separate agreement with the Germans. However, in the atmosphere, which abounded in both fact and rumour, we as military men had no right to exclude the possibility. This gave the Berlin operation special urgency. We had to consider the possibility that the fascist leaders would prefer to surrender Berlin to the Americans and British rather than to us. The Germans would open the way for them, but with us they would fight fiercely and to the last soldier. In his planning, Koniev had soberly considered the prospect in order to beat either Marshal Zhukov or the Western Allies to Berlin, Koniev knew that he had to overwhelm the enemy within the first few hours of his attack. Unlike Zhukov, Koniev had no infantry-filled bridgehead on the Nace's western bank. He had to hurdle the river in force, and it was a formidable obstacle. The Nace was an icy, swift-flowing river. In places it was 150 yards wide, and although the eastern banks were relatively flat, the western shore sloped up steeply. The Germans had taken full advantage of these natural defences. They were now entrenched in a number of heavily fortified concrete bunkers overlooking the river and its eastern approaches. Koniev had to overwhelm the enemy quickly if he was to avoid being pinned down by fire from these bunkers. His plan called for armoured divisions to be thrown into the attack the moment footholds were secured on the western banks, but that meant building bridges across the river even before the protective smoke screen dissipated, and, if the bombardment had not knocked out the enemy, it might have to be done under heavy fire. He intended to make his main crossing in the area of Buchholz and Trebel, but there would also be others. Koniev, convinced that he must achieve the complete and rapid smothering of the enemy, had ordered an enormous river assault, with crossings at more than 150 places. At each site, his engineers had vowed to have bridges or ferries available in one to three hours. At 6.55 a.m., the second stage of Koniev's plan unfolded. All along the eastern bank, first-wave troops emerged from the forests under cover of the continuing artillery fire and, in a miscellaneous collection of boats, headed across the Nysa. Immediately behind them came a second wave of men, and behind them a third. In the buchholz Trebel area, Shock troops of Pukov's 13th Army swarmed across the choppy waters, dragging sections of pontoon bridges. Leading the way was the 6th Guards Rifle Division, commanded by Major General Georgi Ivanov, a tough 44-year-old Cossack. Ivanov had put everything that would float into the water. Besides pontoons, he used empty aviation fuel tanks and large German fertilizer bins, which he had ordered welded to make them airtight. 
these were manhandled into position as bridging supports. In the water were hundreds of engineers. As fast as prefabricated wooden bridge sections were pushed off the eastern bank, the engineers bolted them together. Scores of men stood neck deep in the icy nase, holding heavy bridging beams above their heads, while others drove wooden supports into the riverbed. Special teams of engineers hauled cables across the Nice in boats equipped with hand-operated winches. On the western bank they set up ferry heads and then manually wound in the cables, pulling floats with guns and tanks across the river. At some places engineers got guns across without the ferry floats. They simply dragged them along the riverbed on the end of the cables. The operations were moving steadily forward despite enemy fire nearly everywhere along the line. To protect the crossings, Ivanov used shore batteries which fired directly above the heads of his troops and into the German defences on the western bank. He supported these batteries with a hail of fire from no less than 200 machine guns, just to keep their heads down. At 7.15am, Konyev got good news. The first bridgehead had been seized on the western bank. One hour later, he learned that tanks and self-propelled guns had been ferried across and were already engaging the enemy. By 8.35 a.m., at the end of a two-hour and 35-minute bombardment, Konyev knew with absolute certainty that his troops were well-established west of the Nysa. They had so far secured 133 of the 150 crossings. Units of Pukov's 13th Army, together with forces of the 3rd Guards Tank Army, had already punched through the centre in the assault area at Trebel, and by all accounts the enemy in front of them seemed to have cracked. The armour of the 4th Guards Tank Army was now moving across in the same sector, and to the south men of the 5th Guards Army were over the river. It looked to Konyev as if his tanks might achieve a breakthrough at any moment. Once that was accomplished, Konyev planned to dash for the cities of Spremberg and Cottbus. Past Cottbus, he would head out on the road net for Lubin. That area held special interest for Konyev. It was the terminal point of the boundary line laid down by Stalin, separating Zhukov's first Belarusian front and his own first Ukrainian front. If Konyev got there fast enough, he planned to ask Stalin immediately for permission to swing north and head for Berlin. Confident of the go-ahead, Konyev had already sent written orders to Colonel General Pavel Semenovich Rybalko of the 3rd Guards Tank Army to be prepared to break into Berlin from the south with a tank corps reinforced with a rifle division from the 3rd Guards Army. It looked to Konyev as though he might just beat Zhukov to the city. He was so engrossed in the progress of his attack that he did not realise how lucky he was to be alive. In the first moments of the assault, a sniper's bullet had drilled a neat hole through the tripod of his artillery glasses, inches away from Konyev's head. On the eastern fringes of Berlin, the hammering of the guns, less than 35 miles away, was like the sullen thunder of a far-off storm. In small villages and towns nearer the Oder, there were some strange concussion effects. In the police station at Malsdorf, books fell off their shelves and telephones rang for no reason. Lights dimmed and flickered in many areas. In Dahlwitz Hoppergarten, an air raid siren suddenly went berserk and no one could switch it off. Pictures fell from walls, windows and mirrors shattered. A cross hurtled down from the steeple of a church in Muncheberg, and everywhere dogs began to howl. In the eastern districts of Berlin, the muffled sound echoed and re-echoed in the skeletal, fire-blackened ruins. The fragrant smell of burning pines wafted across the fringes of Köpenick. Along the edges of Weissensee and Lichtenberg, a sudden wind caused curtains to whip and flap with ghostly abandon, and in Erkner some inhabitants of air raid shelters were jolted out of sleep, not by noise, but by a sickening vibration of the earth. Many Berliners knew the sound for what it was. In the Möhrings Pankow apartment where the Weltlingers were hiding, Siegmund, who had been a World War I artilleryman, instantly recognised the far-off sound as that of a massive artillery bombardment. He woke his wife, Margaret, to tell her about it. At least one Berliner claimed to have actually seen Zhukov's rolling barrage. Shortly after 4am, 16-year-old Horst Rumling climbed a seven-storey tower on the western edge of Weissensee 
and stared eastward through field glasses. Horst quickly informed the neighbours he had seen the flash and glare of Russian guns, but few believed him. He was considered a wild, fanciful boy at best. The sound did not penetrate the central districts, although here and there some Berliners claimed they heard something unusual. Most thought it was probably anti-aircraft fire, or the detonation of unexploded bombs dropped during the night's two-hour and 25-minute air raid, or perhaps the sudden collapse of a bomb-blasted building. One small group of civilians learned almost immediately that the Russian offensive had started. They were the operators in the main post office telephone building on Winterfeldstrasse in Schöneberg. Within minutes of the opening barrage, long distance and trunk line sections of the exchange were jammed with calls. Nervous Nazi party officials in areas near the Oder and Neisse called administrative heads in Berlin. Fire brigade chiefs asked whether they should try to put out the forest fires or move their equipment out of the areas. Police chiefs phoned their superiors and everybody tried to get through to relatives. As operators were to recall years later, nearly all those completing calls began their conversations with two words. It's begun. Switchboard supervisor Elizabeth Milbrand, a devout Catholic, took out her beads and silently said, the rosary. By 8 a.m. on April 16, most of Berlin had heard on the radio that heavy Russian attacks continue on the Oder front. The news announcements were guarded, but the average Berliner needed no elaboration. By word of mouth or from relatives outside the city, people learned that the moment they had dreaded had finally arrived. Curiously, at this time, the man in the street knew more than Hitler. In the Führerbunker, the leader was still sleeping. He had retired a little before 3 a.m., and General Bergdorf, his adjutant, had given strict instructions that the Führer was not to be awakened. The strange subterranean world of the bunker had an almost cheerful look this morning. There were vases of bright tulips in the little anteroom, the corridor lounge and the small conference room. Earlier, one of the Reichskanzlei gardeners had cut them from the few flower beds that still remained in the bomb-pitted gardens. It had seemed a good idea to Bergdorf because Eva Braun loved tulips. The Reich's unwed first lady had arrived the night before. With her, she had brought some presents for the Führer from old friends in Munich. One was a book sent by Baroness Baidur von Schirach, wife of the former Reich youth leader. The novel's hero bore every misfortune without losing hope. Optimism, he was made to say, is a mania for maintaining that all is well when things are going badly. The Baroness had thought the book a most appropriate choice. It was Voltaire's Candide. At first, Zhukov did not believe the news. Standing in the Kustrin command post surrounded by his staff, he stared incredulously at Chuikov and then spluttered in rage. What the hell do you mean? Your troops are pinned down, he yelled at the 8th Guards Army commander, and this time there was no friendly use of the general's given names. Chuikov had seen Zhukov angry before, and he remained perfectly calm. Comrade Marshal, he said, whether we are pinned down temporarily or not, the offensive will most certainly succeed, but resistance has stiffened for the moment and is holding us up. Heavy artillery fire from the Silo Heights had hit the troops and supporting tank units as they advanced, Chuikov explained. Also, the terrain through which they were moving was proving extremely difficult for armour. In the marshes and irrigation canals of the Oder Bruch, self-propelled guns and tanks were thrashing and churning helplessly. A number of mired tanks had been hit, one after another, and had gone up in flames. Up to now, said Chuikov, his Eighth Guards had advanced only 1,500 yards. Zhukov, according to General Popiel, gave vent to his fury with a stream of extremely forceful expressions. What had happened to the supposedly irresistible offensive? There were a variety of opinions, as General Popiel quickly discovered when he checked Zhukov's senior officers. General Mikhail Shalin, a corps commander of the First Guards Army, told Popiel he was certain the Germans had been pulled out of the front lines before the attack and placed in a second defensive line along the Silo Heights. Therefore, said Shalin, the majority of our shells fell in open country. General Vasily Kuznetsov, 
commander of the Third Shock Army, was bitterly critical of the first Belarusian plan. As usual, he told Popiel, we stuck to the book and by now the Germans know our methods. They pulled back their troops a good eight kilometers. Our artillery fire hit everything but the enemy. General Andrea Getman, a ranking tank expert and corps commander in Katukov's First Guards tank army, was both critical and angry, particularly about the searchlights. They didn't blind the main forces of the enemy, he said. But I'll tell you what they did do. They absolutely spotlighted our tanks and infantry for the German gunners. Zhukov had never expected the attack to be easy, but although he had anticipated heavy casualties, he had deemed it virtually impossible for the Germans to halt his advance. As he later put it, he had counted on a rapid reduction of the enemy's defences. Instead, he added in a massive understatement, the blow by the front's first echelon had proved to be inadequate. He had no doubt that by sheer weight of armies alone he could overwhelm the enemy, but he was bothered by the danger which now arose that the offensive might be slowed. Zhukov decided to change his tactics. Quickly he wrapped out a series of orders. His bomber fleets were to concentrate on the enemy gun positions. At the same time, artillery was to begin pounding the heights. Then Zhukov took one more step. Although originally his tank armies were not to be committed until after the Silo Heights had been seized, Zhukov now decided to throw them in immediately. General Katakov, commander of the First Guard's tank army, who happened to be in the bunker, got his orders direct. Zhukov left no doubt as to what he wanted. The Heights was to be captured, whatever the cost. Zhukov was going to bludgeon the enemy into submission and, if necessary, bulldoze his way to Berlin. Then, followed by his staff, the stocky marshal left the command post, his anger over the delay still evident. Zhukov had no intention of being slowed up by a few well-placed enemy guns, nor did he intend to be beaten into Berlin by Konyev. On his way out of the bunker, as officers stood aside respectfully to let him pass, he suddenly turned to Katukov and snapped, Well, get moving! The Führer's order of the day reached General Theodore Buss's 9th Army headquarters a little after midday. It was dated April 15, but apparently had been held until Hitler's staff was certain that the main Russian offensive had begun. Commanders were ordered to disseminate the paper at once, down to company level, but on no account was it to be published in the public newspapers. Soldiers of the German Eastern Front, it read, for the last time, the deadly Jewish Bolshevist enemy is going over to the attack with his hordes. He is trying to smash Germany and exterminate our people. You soldiers in the East already know the fate which threatens German women, girls and children. The old men and children will be murdered. Women and girls will be reduced to army camp whores. The remainder will go to Siberia. We have expected this attack and since January everything has been done to build up a strong front. The enemy is confronted by a tremendous amount of artillery. Losses in our infantry have been filled in with countless new units. Alarm units, newly organised units and the Volkssturm are reinforcing our front. This time the Bolshevist will experience the old fate of Asia. He must and shall fall before the capital city of the German Reich. Whoever does not do his duty at this moment is a traitor to our people. Any regiment or division which leaves its position acts so disgracefully that it must be ashamed before the women and children who are withstanding the bomb terror in our cities. Take heed especially of the few traitorous officers and soldiers who, in order to save their miserable lives, will fight against us for Russian pay, perhaps even wearing German uniforms, Anyone ordering you to retreat, unless you know him well, is to be taken prisoner at once and, if necessary, killed on the spot, no matter what his rank may be. If every soldier at the Eastern Front does his duty in the coming days and weeks, the last onrush of Asia will be broken, exactly as in the end the penetration of our enemy in the West will fail in spite of everything. Berlin will remain German, Vienna will be German once more, and Europe will never be Russian. Swear a solemn oath to defend, not the empty concept of a fatherland, but your homes, your wives, your children, and thus our future. In these hours the whole German people look to you, 
my warriors in the east, and only hope that thanks to your constancy, your fanaticism, your weapons and your leadership, the Bolshevist onrush will be smothered in its own blood. At the moment when fate has removed the greatest war criminal of all time from the earth, the turning point of this war will be decided. Bussa did not need an order of the day to tell him that the Russians had to be stopped. Months ago he had told Hitler that if the Russians broke through the Oder Line Berlin and the remainder of Germany would fall. But he was angry to read the talk of a strong front, of an enemy confronted by a tremendous amount of artillery and countless new units. Bold words would not stop the Russians. Hitler's order of the day was, for the most part, fiction. On one point, however, it was crystal clear. Hitler intended German soldiers to fight to the death against both West and East. Bussa had harboured a secret hope, so guarded that he had never voiced it aloud to anyone except Heinrichi and certain of his closest commanders. He had wanted to stand fast on the Oder long enough for the Americans to arrive. As he put it to Heinrichi, if we can hold until the Americans get here, we will have fulfilled our mission before our people, our country and history. Heinrichi had responded tartly. Don't you know about Eclipse? he asked. Busser had never heard of it. Heinrichi told him of the captured plan showing the Allied lines of demarcation and projected zones of occupation. I doubt, said Heinrichi, that the Americans will even cross the Elbe. Despite all, Busser had continued for a time to cling to the idea. Now he finally abandoned it. Even if Elsenhower's forces were to cross the Elbe and drive for Berlin, it was probably too late. Among other things, Hitler was obviously prepared to contest bitterly every mile of an American advance. He was making no distinction between the democracies and the communists. Germany's position was hopeless. So, Busser believed, was the Ninth Army's. But as long as Hitler continued the war and refused to capitulate, Busser could only try to hold the Russians, as he was doing, up to the very last moment.